Hey guys, here I am at the top of page four in your chapter 11 packet. We've got this question about um, hockey and birth dates and how it's related to your success in the league. Um, very, very interesting topic and maybe in psychology or other classes you guys have taken, you've discussed this theory. But we've got, uh, maybe you've heard of this book too, Outliers by this Malcolm dude. Um, he suggests that hockey players' birth months have a big influence on the chance that the player has to make it to the highest levels of the game. So um, he thinks that if you're born early in the year, you have a better athletic ability to be successful versus when you're born really late in the year. So what he's going to test here is he thinks that older players tend to be bigger, stronger, more coordinated, blah, blah, blah. They get more playing time, more coaching, and overall have a better chance of being successful. Maybe you've heard that before. And so he wants to test it. And so what he did is he took 80 NHL players from this season, so a little bit outdated, 2009 to 10, um, but still pretty applicable. And he came up with these statistics. 32 of the 80 people were born in the first quarter, um, 20 in the second quarter, 16 and 12 in the third and fourth, respectively. And so what he wants to do is test to say, well, the fact that 32 of those 80 people were born in the first quarter and only 12 were born in the fourth quarter, and here are the other two statistics, um, does that give us convincing evidence that the birthdays of the NHL players are not uniformly distributed? So remember, you know what uniformly distributed is? We use the word even to sometimes um, describe the word uniformly, although even isn't technically a good statistical word to use there. Um, basically, are they, the hockey players, given an advantage being born early in the year? Another way to say this is my daughter would be screwed given that she was born on December 28th. So we're going to test to see whether or not this is true. So there's a bunch of parameters and stuff we need to set up first. First of all, how do we know this is a chi-squared goodness of fit test? Because we have these statistics here, 32, 20, 16, and 12, we have basically a bunch of categories here, and we're testing the entire distribution um, of values. We're not just testing like one statistic that we gathered. We have a bunch of different categories here with a bunch of different numbers that go with the categories, and we want to test all of them. That's your clue that we're doing a chi-squared goodness of fit versus the two sample or two proportion that we just finished, um, or one statistic that we did earlier in the semester. So remember, there's a couple of things I need to have defined um, in order to gain full credit on the AP here before I begin. So we need to say what the population is. We're looking at NHL players here. Um, and I also want to define what my P1, P2, P3, and P4 are going to be. And I'm using four different P's because I'm looking at four different quarters, the distribution of the people that were born within those quarters. So I'm saying um, very clearly that my P1 is the proportion of players born in the first quarter. Also, P2 would stand for the second quarter. And then it's okay to say, etc. Make sure that you're just making it very, very clear. Remember, some random person out in California is going to be grading your AP, and you want them to be very confident that you are very clear in what all your P's stand for and defining all of your variables. So just make it super obvious. It's okay to say what the first one is and then the second one, and then say the pattern kind of continues in that fashion. So now I need to set up my hoe and my ha. So my, um, what I have to think about here is what am I testing, what am I assuming is true, and then what am I trying to like say is not true. And yes, you can hear my dog barking in the background. Sorry about that. Okay, so what we're saying here, um, do these data provide convincing evidence that the birthdays of NHL players are not uniformly distributed? Okay, cool. That's kind of what my ha is because that's what I'm trying to test and I'm trying to either reject or fail to reject, whatever. And so um, if they were uniformly distributed, what would the proportions be for each quarter? So remember, we have these numbers here that we're testing. And if it didn't matter when you were born, wouldn't a fourth of the NHL players be born in the first quarter and a fourth of them be born in the second quarter, et cetera, and it would be even or uniformly distributed? That's going to be my hope for this problem. I'm going to pause and write it out. All right, so here I've written a few things out. I've got my hoe. Um, and so remember, we're kind of contradicting what's up here, not uniformly distributed. That's what I'm testing. So therefore, I'm assuming that it is uniformly distributed or equal within each category or each proportion is 25%. Um, and I wrote a little note here. If the birthday didn't matter, 
um, then a fourth of the league should be born in each quarter. That's going to be my null hypothesis, and that's what I'm assuming is true. What I'm trying to prove is that something is different. At least one of the proportions, that's how you do the ha for a chi-squared goodness of fit test, at least one of the, in this case we're doing proportions, differs from what is stated. And by stated, we're meaning um, stated here in the ho. Okay? So... Now I gotta say what kind of test I'm doing and why. As you've been noticing throughout whole, like the whole second semester, you guys have been doing all these different tests and um, claims and intervals and all kinds of things. You need to say what you're going to test and how you're going to do it and why. And so remember the verbiage for this is since we are testing a claim, we're doing a test. Um, about a distribution of proportions. It's not a specific proportion. It's a bunch of different numbers, for lack of better words. Um, we're going to use a chi-squared goodness of fit test. So now remember we've got to do these conditions and the conditions are similar but there's one major difference here in this chapter versus the rest that we've done. Um, we still do the random test. We still do the independent um, check but we do not do a normal check and you have to remember you guys, um, it would be very, very wrong. You would get dinged majorly if you tested for normality when you were doing a chi-squared test because remember what the chi-squared graphs look like. They are absolutely not normal. Um, what you're testing for in place of the normality clause is you're testing large sample size, and there's a specific way to go through that. So I'm going to write those out now. So here are my condition checks real quick. Remember, you can't just say random check. Um, what you have to say specifically is what is random about what we have here. We have a random sample of 80 NHL players. Be specific in 80 what do we have here. <clears throat> They're NHL players. Independence, there's two things I'm checking. Individual responses are independent, meaning one person being born in January doesn't have any impact or effect on the fact that the next person might be born in October. Um, and then also since we did sample, we took a random sample, we have to check the 10% condition. There are more than 800 NHL players in the population, therefore the 10% condition is met. Um, make sure you're just being very, very clear and laying out exactly what you're checking and what that means. Remember other textbooks use different conditions, so it's important to say which condition you are checking for. And then here's the large sample size, not the normality clause. What you're checking for is all the expected counts need to be greater than or equal to five. The expected counts are coming from the ho. So we're using the 0.25 as our proportion and we're using it, multiplying it by our sample size. That gives us 20 for all of them. Um, I think it might be okay to put NP1 equals NP2 equals NP3 equals NP4 equals 80 times 0.25 equals 20. I wrote them all out just because that's what I'm in the habit of using. Um, just make sure you're being very, very clear in what it is that you're checking for. Last thing I'm setting up and laying out before I um, go finally <laughs> am able to start doing some actual math is I need to do my alpha, my significance level. We're going to use 0.05 here since none was given in the question. I feel like it's kind of 50-50. Sometimes you're given an alpha and sometimes you are not. And remember, you always use 0.05 when you are not given a significance level to compare to. Um, and we also have the DF. The DF um, in this chi-squared type of test is defined as number of categories minus one. We have four categories here since we're doing four quarters. That's what we're testing. And so four minus one is three. Remember your calculators will ask you for the DF or you'll have to know the DF um, if you're using the chi-squared table. Um, and so that's number of categories minus one. Make sure you write that out just to make sure you don't just have a random three in your work. Be very clear, show whoever's grading your paper that you understand how to find the DF for this problem. Now we're finally ready to do some math. So here is the, um, the layout of how to actually compute the chi-squared. In this case, since we have four categories, it wouldn't be that difficult to do this all in the calculator, but I'll remind you how to do this in the calculator in a second. Um, just make sure that you are showing sufficient work. So even though we only have four categories here, remember for full credit, you need to show the first two iterations of the formula. Then you can use the dot, dot, dot thing and then finish with the last iteration. And that shows you or gives you 11.2 for your chi-squared value. So remember, that's not um, our p-value. That's We're not finished. That's our chi-squared. And I'll get more into that in a second. But to remind you in the calculator, remember you're putting all of your observed values 
Um, so the numbers that were given in the problem, that's in list one in your calculator. And then you're using all these 20s. Um, those are your expected values. Um, that's in list two. And then you go into the test option and there's a chi-squared goodness of fit option. And then you have to actually type in list one and list two for your observed and your expected values. Tell the calculator where you typed your numbers. And it will also ask you for the degrees of freedom. And that will spit out a chi-squared value of 11.2. And it's also going to give you the p-value. So remember, that's kind of a hint into um, what the final answer of this problem is supposed to be. But you still need to show all the work to get full credit. So now that I have my 11.2, I'm going to find my p-value. So remember, what we're trying to find is the proportion um, where the chi-squared is greater than or equal to that 11.2, and that gives us a p-value of 0.011. And yeah, your calculator gave you that, but you could also use um, the calculator to find the p-value, um, or you could be using the table if you're more comfortable with that. You're looking at the chi-squared of 11.2, um, and you are using the degrees of freedom of 3. So now let's look at this p-value here. This is pretty small, 0.011. Is it too small? Is the ho too low? What are we comparing it to again? Oh yeah, we're using 0.05. So this p-value actually is too low. I meant to say is when the p is too low. Um, this p-value is too low compared to 0.05. That means the ho must go. We reject the ho and we favor the alternate. So here's what everything looks like um, to finish up, you guys. You can pause and copy this down. But um, remember, we came up with this low p-value. The p was too low, so the ho must go. And I'm saying since the p-value is 0.011, which is less than the significance level we stated at 0.05, that means we reject the null in favor of the alternate. Remember, we're never using any verbiage that says we accept anything. We are rejecting the null here in favor of the alternate. And then since we are favoring the alternate, restate what the alternate was. At least one of the proportions um, differs from 0.05. And then um, just keep in mind when you reject, you should be able to come up with proportions that um, that are most likely to differ. You can find those in the calculator, but when you reject, this is considered um, necessary for supporting your rejection. So you do need to have to find proportions most likely to differ. You probably could have come up with these, um, not the actual chi-squared comps, but you probably knew that the first quarter and the first fourth quarter, based on going all the way back up to the original problem, 32 and what was it, 12, um, it's pretty obvious that those are the ones that differ the most. Um, but to come up with the chi-squared comps, you find those in the calculator. So remember, after you run the chi-squared goodness of fit test, your calculator creates a list in the list area um, of the chi-squared comps. So just go back into your list where you typed your observed and your expected values and scroll to the right, and you should see all of these comps. Um, the P2 and the P3 are very small numbers. Those are not very different than the 0.25 than we were expecting, the proportions that is. Um, but the P1 and the P4, the P1 was much different than the 0.25, and the P4 also was pretty different, so you need to list those comps. Okay, that is all for today. Um, bring your questions to class. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.